Einen schönen guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, und uh, herzlich willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome to the German Cultural Center. My name is Wolfgang Krüger. I'm the director here at the Goethe Zentrum Atlanta. It's my distinct and great pleasure to welcome you all tonight to this, um, what I hope to be a fabulous presentation, especially since it somewhat hits home. Um, I have been working tirelessly for the past six, seven years together with my friend Claude, as well as my friend Hélène, to get the French and German cultural centers closer to, uh, together, piece by piece by piece, and we have had many, many successful events where we cooperated. And now when, I, when Hélène presented me with the idea that uh, Didier Rosley was indeed a French journalist who had undertaken this endeavor of walking from Paris to Berlin, I thought we have to have this and make this a joint event. Um, Ellen will, of course, much more adequately than I can ever do, uh, present our guest speaker to, for tonight. Before she does, allow me to say that this means actually a great deal for a German of my generation, as I'm sure many others as well. Having had a grandfather who had to serve uh, the army between 1939 and 45, and who happened to be in France as an occupational force, there um, against his will and have, having always had great admiration for France, he came back and survived and I was very lucky in so far that he talked to me about those events very openly and honestly and made it very clear to me that he never himself quite un uh, understood it, uh, why there was this supposedly hostility between our two neighboring great nations. In any event, uh, because of all the talks that I appreciated that I could have with him, he made me think um, a little bit outside the box and made me appreciate our, our neighbor. And so I went there and uh, also had a great love, developed a great love for France. And uh, therefore, it is even a greater pleasure, since Berlin is my hometown, to have found a, a Frenchman who, from Paris, <laughs> indeed, from Paris even, on top of it, who has uh, undertaken such an endeavor, and I'm incredibly curious what his findings were. I honor you tonight by wearing a tie from Paris uh -huh. with my little Berlin button, so Paris Berlin. And uh, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Hélène uh, Couro. Okay, okay, now I got them all. Uh, and she will have the pleasure of um, Welcoming Mr. Monsieur Herrn Didier Rosset. Thank you. Bonsoir. Thank you for coming. We're very excited about this uh, partnership with the Goethe and this event. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, next week we'll have another great lecture at Alliance Francaise um, from a journalist. Uh, his name is Christian Cheneau, and he was a hostage in Iraq for two months, so he will tell about his experience and the risk of being a journalist. And then uh, save the date for a Bastille Day event on July 11th. And so tonight we have the great pleasure of having our old friends, Didier Rousselet, because he came here many times with Claude, and he came last year where he did a one-man show for us at the High Museum. It was very entertaining. And um, our old, and our old friend of Atlanta too, because he knows the streets by heart now. <laughs> <laughs> he remembered Piedmont and Monroe. Um, and uh, he's also a multi-talented artist. Um, he's an actor, he's a writer, he does training for teachers, uh, lectures, uh, he writes books, we brought a few here. Um, so many, many talents, and we're very happy that he's here to tell us a little more about his great adventure that uh, he did last year. Um, and voila. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm mean, indeed uh, especially pleased to be in Atlanta. Uh, I came here several times uh, since uh, 1992, invited by Claude. Uh, so I came uh, three times, thanks to Claude, and this is the second time. Thanks to Hélène, so thank you very much to the U2 and the Alliance Francaise of uh, Atlanta. There is kind of a special uh, connection here. And also, I'm very pleased about the other connection, which is indeed uh, the Alliance Francaise and the Goethe Institute, because it goes perfectly with uh, the topic, the theme of my uh, talk. So thank you very much, Chef Gang, and thank you to the Goethe Institute. Um, I would say a few 
word, words of uh, explanation, introduction. Uh, first, it was a very personal project, and uh, I started to talk about this project around me. So in Washington, the Alliance Française and the Goethe Institute were very interested, so uh, they were in some ways part of the adventure. We did the special events before and after. And I live in Arlington, Virginia, and Arlington has Reims, Reims in France, and uh, Aachen, Aachen uh, in Germany as uh, sister cities. So they did also something uh, around my, uh, my work and uh, special events. Uh, I, ex I did my presentations after in several uh, libraries and, and so on. So I got some support here from uh, my uh, home, which is Arlington. Um, my project was indeed to walk from Paris to Berlin and to write a book about the experience, a book which would not be only a travelogue, not exactly a travelogue, but more a reflection, a meditation about our common history, uh, about uh, the, the relationship between the two uh, uh, countries. Um, the reason for that, uh, I would give a few examples and few information. On October 17, 2003, there was a uh, European summit at Bruxelles, Bruxelles, and uh, Gerhard Schröder, the German chancellor, had to go uh, quickly to Berlin to go back uh, before an important vote at the uh, European summit. And he asked uh, Chirac, uh, he, he gave to Jacques Chirac, the French president, his proxy. So uh, Chirac voted in the name of Germany. So after so many centuries of war and so on, it was a very, very meaningful uh, uh, statement. And it was, I think, one of the events which uh, triggered uh, the envy, the desire to do something about that. Um, we see that in the recent history between France and Germany, there are very strong relations. And these strong relations are um, very strong between the politicians, between uh, Adenauer and de Gaulle, uh, between uh, Schmidt and Giscard d'Estaing, uh, Kohl and Mitterrand, or uh, Schröder and Chirac. But I was wondering if it was true also, is, if this bond was also uh, real between the two people. And we have been in peace for now 64 years. And I checked in uh, the history for the last three or four centuries. It did not happen before. So we are living in a very special time, and I wanted to celebrate that, to celebrate this peace, this friendship, in, in my own and very humble way to help uh, to nurture this uh, relation. Um, each, year in each year, 13 million German people uh, come to France, and each year, 1 million French people go to Germany. So I thought there was a very there a problem. That means German people know more about France than French people know about Germany. Very often, the, the German people don't stay in France, not necessarily. They go to Spain, Portugal, Italy, because they go to the sun, to the Mediterranean side. That's true. But at the same time, they have the time to enjoy, to know more. And I think in France, we don't know enough about Germany. And on both sides, we have the same problem that less and less German students learn French, and less and less French students learn German. So there is here some uh, little uh, uh, problem to, to address. And like uh, most of the French people, I studied uh, English and Spanish, and I felt that in all my life I was uh, not enough in touch with uh, German culture, uh, despite uh, the strong affinities uh, I, en I always enjoy the movies by uh, Werner Herzog or uh, Wim Wenders, for example. I'm absolutely fond of them. And uh, I, I thought there was something missing in my, uh, I would say, uh, culture. Um, and also, in the recent history, in the 70s, uh, the German youth was really, in Europe, the greener. Uh, youth more than any other country. They were really more pro-Europe, pro-peace than in any other country. So I was very, very fascinated by, by that. And that explained that I decided alone in a very exotic way to go from Paris to Berlin to, to know more about Germany and to talk more about uh, this, uh, this question of uh, relation. Of course, you could ask why walking 
because I could have uh, written a, a play. I am mainly uh, indeed a stage director, actor. I'm mainly in theater. Uh, I could have uh, write. Uh, I could have written a, a book, but I decided that uh, working with uh, the pace, the rhythm, the relation with uh, nature, the silence, the solitude uh, was a perfect match for the idea of uh, peace, of meditation. And also walking is very good for the brain. Uh, we just uh, quote uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who used to say, I can only meditate when I am walking. When I stop, I cease to think. My mind only walks with my legs. <laughs> so my, my uh, presentation will be in three parts. The first one will be really about the personal experience, about being on the road, on foot, for so many days. Uh, I call this part uh, the hiker. The second part will be about what I have, what I have seen, uh, the landscapes, uh, the, country, uh, uh, the countries I saw. I call this part the traveler. And the third part is more, and it's a little longer, it's more about my topic. That means about this common history, about peace, about Europe today. And I call, the, I call this part the pilgrim. Because this walk was a pilgrimage. And I wa it was not a religious pilgrimage. It was a civic one. After, of course, I will be glad to answer your, your questions if you have questions. We can uh, switch off the, the lights, maybe. <coughs> Thank you. So a few data. data. Uh, uh, this photo has been taken the day of my departure. I'm just in front of uh, uh, the photographer is back to Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, it was March 21st, uh, 2007. And uh, this photo is when I, come, I arrived in Berlin on May 6th. And this one is the following day because uh, Berlin is very a big city. <laughs> so from the, the limit to the downtown, it took me about one day because it's about 20, 30 kilometers still. Um, I spent 43 days of walking. Uh, I stopped in four cities. Uh, Reims, I can, when I stop, uh, I mean I stayed one day in uh, Reims, in Aachen, in Weimar, when my wife came and joined me and walked with me the, two, the last two weeks, and uh, Leipzig. So between this photo, with, which is taken at the point zero, which is in front of Notre Dame de Paris, and which is a spot from where are numbered uh, you know, all the French roads, to this one, which is on uh, Paritzer uh, uh, Platz, uh, in front of the Brandenburg Gate, uh, I walk uh, 1,400 kilometers. That means approximately 875 miles. That means 32 kilometers or 20 miles a day. And I walk exactly eight hours and 43 minutes each day. <laughs> uh, I had decided on some uh, challenging uh, pace, and I was not uh, uh, disappointed and uh, my feet uh, either. Uh, but they were part of the experience. Uh, it, this is taken three weeks after it was already better. Uh, I had some problem during uh, several weeks at the beginning. Uh, let's go to something a little more pleasing for the eye. <laughs> the ways. So my uh, idea would, would have been to, to walk on, on trails, of course. Um, it would fit more the idea of being in touch with nature, or pilgrimage, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, the trails at that time were very, very muddy. Uh, and they, are, they were also very, I would say, longer. They don't go necessarily where you want to go. You know. So I was along trails only on some portions, and especially in Germany, when I was here, here in the Taunus Mountain. And you see all these um, uh, signs about the different uh, paths, the different uh, trails. Uh, this is along the Limes. That means it was a border of the Roman Empire. And there, many European trails come together and follow the Limes. So I walked along this Limes for uh, two days. 
But most of the times, I was on uh, along uh, roads, sometimes very, very quiet, very pleasant, small roads like this one in Luxembourg, and sometimes on along uh, main and big roads, and it was not so pleasant. Because, uh, of course, with the cars and so on, this is where you wish uh, the end of the car civilization when you walk along these uh, main roads. Uh, in Germany, they, ha they have a wonderful network of bike paths everywhere. You see here we are in uh, Leipzig, and there is already a sign showing uh, Berlin, which is at about 175 kilometers from there. And everywhere you have a bike path, so I followed, I walk along this, these paths. Sometimes they are just along the, the roads, parallel to the road. Uh, and very, very often they are uh, in the countryside. And these are small roads uh, only for uh, farming vehicles and bikes and, of course, pedestrians. So it's very, very quiet. There is almost nobody uh, on these roads. Here it's along the the Rhine River, so it's more touristic, of course. So you have the bike path, and you have the, the path for pedestrians. Along, when, it, when you walk like that for days and days, you realize very, very quickly that you notice, you, you look at things you don't look at usually, little things which are not important or not interesting, you would say. For example, I was uh, very interested in the signs, the road signs, and milestones. I was uh, looking and taking photos of all the different kinds of milestones. This one is an old one, 18th century in France. And here, of course, this is a Voie de la Liberté. That means this is milestones along the, the way from Normandy to Alsace, which was a way of the American army in uh, 1944. La Voie de la Liberté, the path of freedom. So each kilometer you have a, a milestone li like that. One day, I, the, the, the path uh, went, uh, was passing by uh, a big plant, and indeed uh, passing just in the middle of this big plant. And I was wondering, well, I did not know what they were doing in this uh, factory. And the name was Passavant, which is a very French name. So I thought, oh, this is a, a German uh, uh, Huguenot, here, this one from uh, Huguenot maybe, and I did not know what they were uh, doing there, but just a few hundred yards after this uh, plant, I looked and I saw that Passavant was on the manhole. That means they, they build indeed uh, manholes. So along my way, I was always repeating for myself, reading Passavant, Passavant, Passavant. <laughs> the same way in Paris, if you look at the manholes, you will say Pont-à-Mousson, 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 which is a city in France where they build these manholes. One thing interesting, of course, is to see how his uh, roadside and to compare roadsides between France and Belgium and Luxembourg, because I went, because I went to Aachen, so I went north, through a part of Belgium and Luxembourg and Germany. I can say that, uh, unfortunately, in France, uh, you will see packages of everything you can eat, drink, or smoke. And Belgium, in Belgium, the same thing. In Belgium, they seem to enjoy the beer Jupiler. <laughs> there are Jupiler cans everywhere. When you arrive in Luxembourg, you see the difference. Suddenly, nothing. Perfectly clean. I was in Luxembourg just two days, and in two days, I saw several teams of people mowing the lawn, uh, pruning the trees, cleaning, checking, painting. Everything is absolutely uh, perfect. So I was uh, wondering, how will it be in Germany? Well, it was half-half. <laughs> um, when you are close to Belgium and France, it's almost like in France and Belgium. <laughs> when you go more to the east, it becomes more and more cleaner. But everywhere in Germany, you have McDonald's waste. That's something very, very impressive. And something you don't have in France, I would say. Everywhere you have this. This is the main thing you can see when you, when you, when you walk uh, in Germany. I remember one day uh, I walked by uh, a McDonald's uh, restaurant. 
and I was on the main uh, road uh, for maybe three kilometers, and there were so many wastes uh, like that along the road. Then I turned, I left, and I went to a small road in the countryside. It was perfectly peaceful, uh, nothing. It was perfect, and um, it was spring, of course, so the the green the the wheat was green. And suddenly, I see uh, in the air a brown bag floating and landing just near me. So I rush and take a photo, to take a photo and to show to the world how McDonald's is polluting <laughs> Germany. I was so upset about that, uh, and this is a photo, but unfortunately it was Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I switch to another subject, <coughs> less uh, funny, um, I was expecting to see and to think about many young deaths. I mean, all the young deaths in France and Germany, all the people who had been the victims of the wars. And I knew, and I, we'll talk about that later, about all the cemeteries along the, the, the walk, the way. But uh, I was surprised by how many times I saw memorials of people who have been killed on the road. These are not tombs, of, of course. People are not there, are not buried there, but there are memorials. Sometimes it's just a few flowers, plastic flowers on the tree. Sometimes uh, a cross, uh, different little things. Sometimes you have uh, toys uh, and so on. And most of these people are very young. This one uh, was 21, you see. And most of these people died on two wheels. Uh, bikes, motorbikes, and so on. You know, sometimes it's quite fancy. Sometimes it's just a little wooden piece like that. You know, with the dates. You see, 19 years old. Yeah. Uh, so it was very. Uh, one day, I remember I was uh, walking to uh, Wittenberg, uh, and so uh, this part of Germany. And uh, in the afternoon, I, I saw six memorials on a section of maybe 10 kilometers. Um, what I can say, I, uh, most of them were uh, indeed on, on two wheels. What I can say for sure is they, are, were, no, they were not walking because nobody walks. I mean, if, I, if you go to a third world country, you will uh, see on the road people who walk, people who bike. You will see uh, carts, you will see uh, uh, carriages, uh, animals, and everybody is pulling, uh, uh, pushing, carrying things, and so on. Um, plus the cars, of course, uh, buses and trucks. But here, in, I mean there, like here, you have only cars and trucks. Nobody walks on, on, on the road. And when you walk, you are such a surprise that even you know, the cars just <laughs> rush to see you because it's the first time they see something like that. And in, I, in my uh, 49 or 47 days, I saw one person. I met this guy who is from Berlin. His name is Goetz. And he came to me, and he was walking from Berlin to Avignon in the south of France. <laughs> and uh, since then, we exchange uh, emails, of course, uh, regularly, and we plan to do something somewhere, uh, some kind of symbolic walk also, uh, French German, uh, in some places. I was lucky to, to start my trip uh, at the end of March and to finish at the beginning of May. When I started, it was really cold. It was really winter. And when I arrived in Berlin, it was quite summertime. So that means I saw in a few weeks a passing of the, the seasons. You know. So I began with the, the fog, uh, the rain. This is in Reims along the canal. Um, this is in northern Lorraine. You see it's very misty. And uh, this is the Marne, which was uh, flooding. On the trees, you had only, uh, at that time, uh, mistletoe. And then I saw everything uh, uh, blooming, uh, blossoming, budding first, and then <laughs> blossoming uh, in the forests, in forests again, or uh, along the, the meadows and uh, in the orchards. I saw the dandelions uh, growing and dying. 
And above all, I was uh, nicely surprised by the color of so many fields where they grow colza, which is canola. Uh, and in fact, it was the first time for me after many, many years, uh, first time for me to walk in springtime in Europe. And I did not remember about uh, colza or canola. And in fact, indeed, I checked. It's quite a, a new, <laughs> a new uh, cr uh, crop. And uh, France and Germany, especially Germany. Germany is the first uh, country to export uh, canola oil. So I saw there, I saw these, this color coming everywhere, like an uh, ocean of uh, yellow. The interesting thing about walking is the fact that uh, you see things in a very different way. Uh, that means uh, if, you, if you drive, there are many things you will not uh, see the same way and you will not, you will not appreciate and also uh, you don't, you don't des deserve <laughs> to see uh, this way. Uh, so for me, the landscape was quite uh, very, very charming very often. And I was lucky because I was walking uh, east. So that means uh, each day at the end, in late afternoon, when I was arriving to the small village or towns where I was supposed to, to spend the night, there was a wonderful light coming from behind me on this village. And so each time I was very, very, uh, I liked very much what I, what I saw. I remember this place, I was just coming out of a, a forest, going down the hill. There was this valley and a small village, which is just, just the south of uh, Eisenach, and which is called uh, Marzul. And when I saw that, I remember feeling that it was like the most beautiful place on earth. If you look at that, maybe you don't have the same feeling. You understand that? But for me, it was very important, and uh, I baptized this effect, the Mark Zul effect, <laughs> in my uh, personal <laughs> mythology. So let's go to part two, uh, the traveler. I went through different, uh, I didn't go through mountains, unfortunately, something more, I uh, would say, impressive. This, but I went through uh, some uh, various uh, landscapes. Here, this is Champagne which is very white because, uh, you know, the, it's a uh, choke, you know. And uh, here this is a Rhine Valley with a typical landscape. You, know, the, you have always uh, some ruins of medieval castles. Here are the, the Haut Plateau, High Plateau in uh, Luxembourg, or in Belgium, Les Hautes Fagnes, which is, um, here it's, uh, uh, there is a pit, it's a lot of pit bugs, you know, les tourbières. And uh, it was, uh, I wanted to go cross, to cross this place, which is kind of a marshland. Uh, it's very windy. It's, and um, it was impossible because you see the, the grass is still uh, very uh, yellow. I mean, no, it's not green at all because this is uh, the grass of the previous year. So that means it's very dangerous to go because the fire can take up, can catch up very, very easily because you know the, the tourbières, the pit bugs, are uh, burned very easily. You know. So the Autofagne, here this is uh, the towns in uh, Germany. Uh, I took a lot of photos of uh, industrial uh, aspects, uh, plants, uh, mines. This is a potash uh, mine, a nuclear power plant. I just slept nearby along the Rhine River. And along the Rhine River also, this crane, uh, which was built in the 16th century. And just nearby, there is a more modern one. And uh, this is at uh, Andernach, uh, which is a little north of uh, Koblenz. And that's a proof that this place has been a very important uh, harbor, river harbor, since the Middle uh, Ages. I went for some historical places, some places I always wanted to, to visit and I did not know. For example, this one, this small village, is very important in French uh, history. Uh, this is Varennes. Uh, June 21st, uh, 1791, the French king wanted to, Louis XVI, Louis XVI, uh, wanted to, to flee from Paris uh, uh, two years after the beginning of the French Revolution to go and join uh, the armies uh, in the eastern part of France. 
and uh, he had to change uh, horses and carriage in this place and he waited uh, near the big uh, the house with the, uh, the clock there he waited there and the people who were supposed to give him uh, fresh horses and a carriage were just waiting on the other side of the small river and so he spent one or two hours waiting there and knowing not knowing that and that gave uh, the time to Drouet uh, a man who had recognized uh, the king at the previous stop at saint menu to come with a few uh, people and to arrest, uh, to grab the king and to bring him back to Paris. Some cathedral along the way, Meaux, Reims, with the new uh, stained glasses by uh, Chagall, 20th century stained glasses, uh, Aachen, where there is a Charlemagne, Charlemagne uh, church with the, the, the throne, uh, the throne of uh, Charlemagne inside, and here Erfurt. Castles also along the way, uh, Esch sur Sur in Luxembourg, uh, Donsburg, and of course uh, Potsdam, Sans Souci, near uh, Berlin. I met a few uh, famous characters, like uh, Saint Boniface uh, facing. Uh, uh, the town hall of uh, Fulda, Saint Boniface, who, who brought uh, uh, Christianism to the Saxons, and uh, Beethoven in front of the uh, bell towers of the cathedral of Bonn, and uh, Luther, Luther, and uh, Eisenach, where he studied, and in Wittenberg, where he started um, the Reformation. I saw everywhere sculptures of Bach. Uh, Wagner, Cranach, and so on, but many of Goethe. So that's the right place to <laughs> talk about Goethe. Here we are in Weimar, in front of the National Theatre, and the man on the left is uh, Goethe, and the man on the right is Schiller. So the main two uh, poets and uh, playwrights of um, Germany, or at least at the, the end of 18th, beginning of 19th century. So Goethe is everywhere. This is his first uh, house in Weimar. This is the one he, he, he has later. Weimar, still. Always in Weimar. Amelia's house. Amelia was uh, the mother of the, the prince of Weimar and was uh, uh, Goethe's uh, secret love. And here, this is the house of Charlotte von Stein. Charlotte von Stein is uh, the woman who inspired uh, Goethe to write uh, Werther. Is uh, most uh, the first and the most famo no famous novel, which is really the first novel of uh, romanticism. Uh, so Charlotte von Stein used to live there, and now this is the Goethe Institute of Weimar. And uh, Charlotte von Stein is reenacted uh, by my wife, Monica, here. <laughs> and just uh, not so far from Weimar, this is uh, Leipzig. Well, in Leipzig, there, is some, uh, there are some passages, like in Paris, you know, with uh, shops on both sides, and you see Mephisto and, uh, on the uh, cafe, and you see some uh, sculptures of uh, Mephisto and uh, Faust, because this is a place of the famous uh, tavern Auerbach, uh, where uh, a big part, an important scene of uh, Faust takes place under, underneath. And here, uh, this house which was uh, an uh, hotel in the past, uh, the Golden Lion, Golden Love. Uh, it's important in uh, uh, European history because in 1869 was founded there the first uh, Workers' Party, the ancestor of all the Socialist Party uh, in Europe, founded by uh, Bebel and Lipknecht. And Bebel and Lipknecht were at the House of uh, Representatives uh, in Prussia. And there were the only two people to vote one year later to vote against the war uh, against France. And for that reason, they spent a few years in prison. Um, a few photos about the charming uh, villages uh, with their uh, towers, uh, bell towers, and, and also uh, a lot of uh, half-timbered houses and some uh, baroque town halls like this one in uh, Gotha, uh, built in, at the end of the 16th, uh, 16th century. A lot of, uh, in Germany, a lot of uh, fountains, uh, sculptures in the towns, 
the mix of modern and ancient here, this is uh, uh, Jena. And everywhere, uh, downtowns are pedestrian, for pedestrian uh, mainly. So that's a very, very charming fact, you know. In small towns, big towns, everywhere for pedestrians. Uh, typical German thing, which is uh, the, the cleanliness, I would say. Uh, that's true. That's true when you compare to France. And uh, this is a small village. This is Monday morning, you know, and uh, all the you know, trash bins are there, and the village absolutely uh, perfect. Of course, everybody is supposed to behave, including <laughs> the dogs. Um, I was happy to, to find uh, some places I have never heard of. Like this one was each time. Uh, I arrived in this small uh, city one night. It was not on any of the guidebooks I had read. It's in the Taunus. So it's, uh, let's say, maybe 50 kilometers northwest of uh, Frankfurt. And uh, downtown uh, each time is full of old houses, absolutely beautiful like these ones, you know, very, very well uh, decorated and going back to the 16th or 17th uh, century. I had the time to make some observations about uh, the way young German girls like colors in their hair, <laughs> <laughs> about some uh, strange crops. What is this? Asparagus. Asparagus. Asparagus uh, and uh, asparagus are very successful in Germany. Everywhere there are, it was a time of, of course, the time of asparagus in, in the year of the spring. So everywhere there was some advertisement for asparagus and uh, even uh, giant uh, asparagus <laughs> smiling to you. <laughs> and um, we know that uh, Germany is very uh, important in the uh, very fund of wind power and because in Germany is about 27 times <coughs> smaller than the United States and they produce two times more wind power. So you see indeed the wind turbines uh, almost everywhere in, in the landscape. And what's striking also, if we compare to France, it's more dense, the population is more important, the country is smaller so that means uh, I had the impression that I was always crossing uh, highways, you know, uh, trains and uh, power lines, and not crossing but seeing plants <laughs> in, in, in the sky, you know. I had some uh, questions before my uh, trip about the evolution of the ex-East Germany. And I saw different aspects. First, that's true that uh, some uh, suburbs, uh, the places where the industry was important, some places like that are really run down. There are some neighborhoods, you cross the city, the beginning and the end of the city is very, very, in very bad shape. But downtown, there are so many works everywhere. They are renovating everything. They are building also big things like bridges. This is a bridge over the Elbe River just uh, before arriving at uh, Wittenberg. So, and these are all the, you see, all the houses or buildings in Leipzig who are supposed to be destroyed soon and replaced by something more modern. And you see that everywhere. You see on the left you have the renovated house, on the right the way they were. Uh, they are still in many places. And of course, uh, Berlin is very impressive. Uh, it's really... Uh, a uh, work in progress. Uh, there are buildings everywhere. This is part of the Bundestag and the river spray here. And uh, there is this wonderful uh, architecture, the, the dome which has been added to the old Reichstag. And uh, you see the in, in, inside, you see like uh, a cone, a uh, pyramid uh, inversed, and inside this is like that. And that brings the light down and under that, you have the, the house. Yeah. And uh, on the top of the dome, you have a wonderful uh, panorama view on the city. It was raining the, the day I was there, so you see the, the, the drops of the rain. And, and I arrived at part three, the pilgrim. Uh, I wanted to 
to see and to talk about the, the interconnection between France and Germany, between French people and German people. And of course, starting from Paris going to Berlin, I saw more of France and French people in Germany than the opposite. I just want to say a few things, a short thing, that uh, you know uh, Champagne, the wine, and you know some of the brand names like uh, Bollinger, Mum, Mum, Heidzik, and so on. They are all German names. Champagne was a very uh, modest and unknown wine uh, to, until the middle of the 19th century. And then German entrepreneurs started to work on Champagne and to make Champagne known everywhere in the world. So it was funny because I was thinking of uh, the, the perfect image of la vie parisienne, the Parisian life. You have people who sip Champagne and who listen to Parisian music by Offenbach. <laughs> so it's difficult to be more German than the Parisian life. Uh, in the 19th century in France, in Paris, between the Second French Revolution, 1830, and the Third French Revolution, 1848, there were in Paris uh, 170,000 German people. Because they, were, they, they had some revolutions also in 1830, 1848 in Germany, and then, of course, the king came, the king, the prince, uh, the count came, uh, came back, you know, so they had to, to escape, to flee, and they came to, to France. You know? So at that time, uh, they, were, uh, they were really a big part of the city in Paris. Karl Marx and Engels were there, but also Heinrich Hein, many uh, intellectual artists and so on. On the other side, on the German side, the, the French presence was more obvious. Here I am in, we are in Berlin, on a Gandam market, Gandam market, which is one of the main squares in, in, in Berlin, and there are two churches, the German one and the French one. This is a French one. They are absolutely twins. They look absolutely the same. Um, in the 16th century, there was a religion, a religious wars in France. And uh, the end of the war was the Edit de Nantes, the Edict of Nantes by Henry IV. Uh, it was uh, 1598. 1598, yes. And one century later, with Louis XIV, the king's uh, son, there was a revocation. The Edi de Nantes it was revoked. So that means the Protestant lost what they had uh, won one century before. That means the liberty of their, uh, of their uh, religion. So many, many French Protestants went to England, Netherlands, North America, and more than any other place, Germany. Uh, for example, the, the, the elector of Brandenburg, uh, Frédéric William, immediately after the revocation de l'Édit de Nantes, uh, wrote the Edict of Potsdam, 1685 also, inviting the French people to come in Berlin. So in, at the beginning of the 18th century, at the time of the, when they built these two churches, uh, the French Protestants, the Huguenots, Huguenots were 6,000 in Berlin, and that time, it was a quarter of the population in Berlin. And they, they played a very important role in the growing of Prussia in every aspect of the life there. A great role in the economy and other aspects. So the, you see uh, the French presence there. Here, this is a Paris uh, Platz, Paris uh, Platz. Uh, and it's just in front of the Brandenburg Gate. And now, again, after many years, the French embassy came back there uh, on Paris Place. Yeah. And here, maybe, this is uh, you're going <laughs> to drive this car. Uh, I had read a book about the French Huguenot and the, the, the diaspora, the Huguenot diaspora. And on, in one of these books, I saw that uh, little town, Friedrichsdorf, about 25 kilometers north of Frankfurt, uh, has been founded by some uh, Huguenot family, including a family whose name was Rousselet, my name. So I said, ah, it's on my way. I will go and check this little uh, town. So in the end, on the main square, there is uh, a sculpture about uh, thanking the, the prince 
who invited them to go to come there. And I went to the cemetery and I saw lots of old tombs with French names. And I saw even a Rousselet. I walk a little more in this uh, cemetery and suddenly I arrived in a place, in the corner, everyone was Rousselet. Uh, I saw so many tombs with uh, Rousselet name. It's the first time of my life I saw so many tombs with my name on it. And uh, the interesting thing beyond the, the anecdote, you see this uh, Pauline Rousselet, she died on April 2nd, 1924. And it's written in French. That means 240 years after the Huguenots arrived in Germany, we're still using the French. Maybe in their life, but uh, for sure in, uh, in their death, you know. So that means at that time, it was, they, they have kept some traditions, I'm sure. And that means also that even in 1924, it was not bad to sound French in Germany. So I found this uh, quite uh, interesting. Talking about the relation uh, between our two countries is, of course, first talking about the wars of the past. Here, this is Valmy, which is a place of a very important uh, battle during uh, the French Revolution. Here, this is Jena, and uh, this is a place where Napoleon was during the battle. And uh, I went through Verdun, and you, if you read that, you see that uh, Verdun was destroyed in, and you have all the years where Verdun was a victim of the war. You know, that's quite, uh, of course, impressive and, and, and sad. Near Verdun, uh, the most um, moving part of my trip was indeed walking around Verdun and seeing everywhere the traces, the rests of the First World War. That means 90 years after. You see the trenches, you see the shell holes still. And here this is Fleury devant Douaumont. When you enter a village in France, you have this sign with the name of the village, and then you cross the village, and then you exit at the other end of the village. You have the same sign with, which is crossed at the end of the village. When you enter Fleury devant Douaumont, you have the sign. You walk 500 me meters, something like that, you have the exit sign. And between the two signs, there is nothing, absolutely nothing. The village has been taken 16 times in 1916 during the Verdun battle and completely destroyed. And it's part of nine villages which are more pour la France, dead for France. So they are officially villages, and they still have a mayor. I don't know how they elect this mayor <laughs> because there is no more people living there since 1916. It was impossible to come back. Uh, it was too dangerous. I mean, every, uh, still in, uh, everything was exploding everywhere. And when I, the, day, the day I was in Verdun, that was the title of the local newspaper, oh. Explosion. A John, uh, young man from Verdun was just killed that same day I was there. And it happens regularly. That means people still find some shells, some uh, uh, kind of uh, arms, you know, in the fields, and they just go on exploding uh, almost one century uh, later. I, along the way, I saw the way people of the countries, uh, the politicians, and so on, uh, talk about the, the past. The way sometimes they are still, they wear they were celebrating the wars and the victories. This is the first photo I took. It's in Paris, it's uh, Rue Saint-Martin. This is uh, La Porte Saint-Martin, which is a uh, triumph arc uh, built for uh, Louis XIV. And it celebrates uh, some victories above against a few uh, European people and especially uh, the Germans. So one, that's one among many others. And this one is very, very impressive. It was the most impressive of all. It's in Leipzig. It's a monument of the Battle of the Nations. Um, in an 1813, uh, Napoleon's army was uh, vanquished by a, a coalition of people from uh, Germany, Austria, Russia, and so on. Uh, the battle... Uh, 
uh, took place there in about in six days, uh, 60,000 people died. They decided to do a big monument. It was difficult to raise the money, and finally they, they got all the money they wanted. They built the very, very strong, very strong. You see the, the people here. See? You see the size. So you, you see how big it's, its monument. And the monument uh, was inaugurated in 1913, one century after, and one year before the World War. Everywhere you have, uh, you can uh, follow the trails of the uh, Napoleon armies. You can be part of some reenactment. Um, <laughs> I thought the better way to s talk about that is really to visit the cemeteries. Uh, this is a British one in Champagne, and then an Italian one. <coughs> Each country brings its own. Uh, the country comes with the cemetery. I think the British one was alone in the grass, and the Italian, uh, you have the cypress. And this is a French one, and uh, a German one. And in some places, like this one, French and German soldiers are just buried together because it was impossible to know who was who. And uh, i just give you a few uh, numbers. In the First World War, uh, there were more than 8 million French uh, soldiers. 4 million were uh, injured, and 1 million point four were killed. And there were 12 million German soldiers. More than 5 million were injured, and uh, 2 million died. So I mean, on each side, uh, about one out of two was injured, and one out of six died. And as I was walking, it was uh, March, April, May 2007, two years ago, it was a French um, campaign for the, the election of the president. And I was hearing, uh, and I found that uh, the, two can the two main candidates and other, but mainly the two main candidates on, left, on the left side and the right side of the political spectrum were using both of them some nationalistic expressions, which I did not like very much, because for me nationalism, the, the best example uh, the best result is what we see here uh, in 1914, all the countries were absolutely, all the politicians and uh, uh, the powerful people uh, were willing to go to war because uh, each of them were thinking, we are the best country. You know? And the Germans, the French, uh, the English, uh, the Russian, uh, and so on, everybody was ready to go, and it was a big, uh, of course, it was a suicide. A suicide. And uh, I thought there is kind of an irony. Um, I will give you explain to you. I, I wanted to go to one of these cemeteries and I walk and I read aloud and my small uh, recorder the names of the people there. And I will read just a few of them. De Bon Louis, Gig Ulysse, Thomas Jean, Renaud Lucien, Vernet Claude, Combe Pierre, Grégoire Charles, La Barrière Jean, Martin Jean, Vincent Eugène, and so on. So all these names, <coughs> first names and last names, are really typical old French names going back to the Middle Ages. If I read a list of French names today, it would be a little more exotic. <laughs> there would be some Polish, Italian, uh, Spanish, North African, African, Asian names, and so on. Of course, but the people who wanted so strongly a uh, strong nation, in fact, uh, the result uh, we had to replace all the young French men who died in this war, and the immigration was very, very strong immediately after the First World, mainly uh, beginning with the Polish, the Italian people, and then the rest of the, the world. Last year, the last French veteran died. He was 109 years old. And uh, I think it's very, very important for the new generation uh, to keep the memory of these wars so they don't uh, fall in the oblivion. These are for the Muslim uh, soldiers. Fortunately, uh, we have been in peace. Here, this is in Verdun also, and this is a famous photo, center one, with Mitterrand on coal hand in hand. Uh, and I was happy to see, for example, in a, in a small village, uh, the name is uh, Zinghofen, 
near uh, Nassau, that the CDU, which is a party on the right side in, in Germany, very SPD and CDU, was advertising for the, for the party and was underlining the fact that they were a European party. And you see a photo of Adenauer and de Gaulle, the photo we have already seen of uh, Mitterrand and Kohl, and also Angela Merkel and uh, Barroso, who is at the head of the European uh, Commission. And uh, so uh, we have been lucky to, to live in, in this period of uh, reconciliation and friendship. And uh, we just give one symbolic fact. Um, uh, two years ago, when after Sarkozy was elected uh, May 6, the day I was arriving in, uh, in uh, Berlin, um, and he became uh, president 10 days later, officially, on uh, Wednesday, May 16. In the morning, uh, it was the inauguration, and in the afternoon, he was already at Berlin to meet Angela Merkel as a symbol of the close relations between the two countries. One aspect of these relations is the fact that uh, everywhere uh, you see sister cities. This is, Ar uh, this is Arken. So Arlington is a sister city, uh, as I told you, sister city of uh, Arken. It's the first because it's by uh, alphabetic um, order. And, uh, but there is Reims in France and so on. Here, this is Eisenach. Eisenach has Sedan as a sister city. Sedan where uh, happened a big battle in the, the Prussian War. It was the defeat of the French army, 1817. And each time, in each village, when, in each French village, when there is only one sister village or city, it's a German one. And in each German village where there is only one sister city, is a French one. And especially in the parts of the two countries where they suffer the most of the, the wars. Mm -hmm. So that's something uh, interesting to, to notice. Uh, here we are at uh, Ems. Ems, bad Ems. Um, here there is uh, something re to remember the people, to remind the people that there, there was a very important meeting between the French ambassador and uh, William I, William uh, uh, the king uh, of Prussia, and uh, the result of that meeting is a war, the Prussian War, you know. And you have the sculpture of uh, William I here, and the day I was there, just in front of William, there was a French market. <laughs> and you could uh, eat cheese and uh, saucisson and uh, drink wine under the beard and the nose of uh, William. <laughs> the borders disappear. In Europe, the borders disappear. I was uh, entering Belgium. I did not see any sign about Belgium. So I went back. Ah, yes, there was a sign about France. So in one way, it was the other way, nothing. I arrived in Germany, and you see, you know, you see where it's here, you know. It's smaller. You see the speed limit. You see the name of the street. You see a lot of indication. And there, you see you are changing. You are in a new country. It's very, very uh, discreet. It seems that all the beavers are eating the borders <laughs> the way they do here between uh, Saxe and Saxe-Anhalt. <laughs> and of course, the Iron Curtain, the, the most important border, the most impressive rest of the, of the past. It's not written on the maps. I don't know exactly because I was not following a big uh, road at that time. I was really in the countryside from small village to another. I said, where is the Iron Curtain? Where? Is it still possible to see it? And indeed, in the forest, I see this road, which, which was on the east side. It was uh, the road for the military uh, vehicles along the borders. And there is no more fence, nothing. But still, sometimes, some places, um, some uh, watch towers in the middle of the countryside. And of course, in Berlin, in Berlin, there are some pieces of the wall which have been kept. Uh, different places to remind us about the past near uh, in Paris. So. And uh, I bought there a small Eiffel Tower. And I put this Eiffel Tower in my backpack. And in Berlin, I went to a small uh, souvenir shop in front of the Brandenburg Gate. And I uh, took, uh, I bought a small Brandenburg Gate and I put my Eiffel Tower there. 
<laughs> and I was leaving. I saw already people wondering uh, about that, you know. And then I came back to Paris, of course, and I took my Brandenburg Gate and I put in the <laughs> shop where I had bought my Eiffel Tower. I did not have really the time to take a good picture because uh, the nice keeper, the charming Parisian nice keeper, said, Pat photo, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> no photos here, please. <laughs> So, and the second anecdote is about uh, a British uh, artist uh, whose name is Amish Fulton. Amish Fulton is a walking artist. It's the way he defines himself. And he walked, among many uh, adventures, he walked from uh, Bilbao in Spain uh, to uh, Holland, going uh, through France, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. And along the Rhine River, he did this thing, which is a piece of art, a work of art, uh, which is a cast iron, and uh, with the, the print of his uh, feet. And um, I was wondering, I was thinking about this, and I'm interested in uh, land art or any kind of uh, sculpture and uh, outside and so on, but I was thinking that maybe the real uh, artistic thing was not this cast iron thing but must but more is work because the way this is the way I feel I work and I said I will write a book and I wrote the book after but I think the main thing was really to work that means I, I am used to do uh, theater and I think the, this work was for me uh, like a play uh, but I realized because I, 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 I worked a lot before my work, uh, learning a lot of things about German culture, reading German literature, and so on. So there, there is this adventure which was like a play. I was a writer, I was a director, I was the actor, I was the only person in the audience. <laughs> and it was so, it was very personal. But at the same time, I have been very, very happy since then to share this uh, experience and uh, I'm happy I was happy tonight to share with you this experience which I think was a nice idea this is the name of, of uh, Hamlet in France and I thank you for sharing with me tonight and um, if we can have Light, maybe? Thank you. So, uh, if you have some uh, questions or remarks. Yes? Did you, uh, did you talk to people that you... I know you just run into yep. this one guy who was on his way to Avignon. Yep. But in the cities and stuff, did you ever talk to people and ask them about how they felt about France or Germany respectively? Yes, a few times. I would say I did not talk a lot because uh, people are always asking uh, about the, the, the encounters. But in fact, during the day, I did not see anybody, as I told you. The, the, the people I saw were in their cars. Yeah. Yeah. So I talk to people. I talk uh, a lot in France and less in Germany because my German was not good enough to have a real conversation. But a few times I had uh, uh, nice conversations. And uh, I had some interesting uh, reactions. It was very interesting. For example, uh, to give you an example, uh, I was in the um, eastern part of Champagne, uh, Sweep, uh, just before Saint Menou, just in the middle of the Champagne, it's very very flat there. And I talked to the to the owners of the small uh, hotel restaurant there, and the guy has a very simple remark. He, he told me, "Mais de nos jours, plus personne ne dit les boches. Nobody uses the word boche, which was a very strong derogative term in France to say the German people, and that's true." That, that means in my family, for example, people uh, uh, older generation, even if it was not aggressive, even if uh, they thought it was great re uh, reconciliation and so on, they could say les boches, you see. And under, I don't know, 75 years old, something like that, it looks absolutely weird. Nobody says this word. So it was a good symptom of a change, you know. Something, indeed, when he saw that, uh, when he said that, I said, oh, yes, that's true. I just forgot. They used to say that. 
you know. Uh, I had very nice reaction the, the few times I talked to people. For example, I was in Germany, and uh, one of the rare moments I met people, I, went, uh, I was just sitting, I had a small uh, break, you know, uh, eating a few uh, almonds and drinking some, uh, sipping uh, some tea. And suddenly on this uh, parking lot, there were two cars coming and uh, maybe ten people coming out of the car. They were celebrating something because they just uh, went out of their cars. And there was a table. It was kind of a, um, a rest area. And they start drinking and eating together. And then the woman came to me and uh, talked to me and said, what are you doing? I'm working from Paris to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> You're working... Oh! So she called everyone, and everyone, everyone comes around me, and we start a very nice, con a nice conversation in French, in German, in English, a mixture, so we understand. And they were just celebrating. They gave, they gave me a drink, and I didn't want uh, to drink anything. I don't drink first and first. I don't want to drink when I walk. <laughs> but they wanted to, to give me something to drink, to eat, and so on. And then when I left, I, was, I was, uh, had to shake all hands and so on because they were happy to meet somebody doing that. So, uh, and I was invited also once. Uh, once I was with my wife and just south of Wittenberg, uh, somebody saw us, asked us what we were doing, and they invited us. So we had a kind of a good day. We, we, we spent one hour there eating and drinking with, with them and so on. So I had a few conversations, but each time I had this conversation, I had very good reaction on both sides of the borders. Yes? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I did. I would say I did what I had planned to do. That means uh, I had planned to do in so many days, and I did exactly the days I had planned before. Um, I did not reserve anything anywhere. And I went to some small hotel, some bed and breakfast, and I had just had two times a problem of finding really something. Two times it was difficult, and uh, I did not find it. So I, uh, I had to take a taxi, or somebody uh, gave me a, a ride. I went to some place, and then the next morning I came back to the same place exactly <laughs> to keep the continuity of my uh, work. Yeah. So I didn't reserve anything, and I knew, for example, I would be uh, this day uh, in Koblenz and that day in uh, Friedrichsdorf. And I knew that between Koblenz and Friedrichsdorf there were, uh, I think, uh, three or four, day, four days of walking. And I didn't know where I would stop. I was, n uh, was not completely precise in my preparation. Uh, I knew, I, I, uh, I designed my way so I would go through meaningful places, which were very, very symbolic of the relationship between the two countries. Verdun, of course, or Jena, but also uh, like the Rhine Valley, uh, Victor Hugo wrote a lot about that. Like uh, Potsdam, Potsdam is a place for the, the kings of Prussia, and so on, but it's also a place for Voltaire. Voltaire was invited by the king and wrote some uh, uh, books there in Potsdam, so I wanted to go there, uh, and so on. So uh, I was more prepared. I was organized. I was mentally prepared. I read a lot. I did not trained so much, and then I followed indeed my, my schedule. Uh, I did not have any, any problem. I discovered it was fine. I mean, uh, 20 miles a day, it was fine. Good. <laughs> yes, um, I had a very, very big breakfast in the morning. <laughs> and then I have a very nice dinner at night. And between the two, I just had a few elements or something like that, just minimum. It's the way I am. But when my wife came, uh, she likes to eat regularly. <laughs> She's very thin, too, but we, she eats regularly. So we, we change the pattern. We, we have more, uh, um, we, we eat more during the, the day. Yeah. Well, uh, question somebody asked, some, uh, did I lose weight? Uh, I can reassure you. For the first time in my life, 
I gained weight. I think it's uh, about one kilo or two pounds or a little more. I think it's only muscles in the, in the legs. <laughs> <laughs> The German sausage. <laughs> no, no, I am a vegetarian. <laughs> did you train for this uh, walk before? In other words, did you start walking um, in your neighborhood? For the, yes, I walked. I walked, uh, but I did not. I didn't do something very, very uh, uh, comparable. That means uh, I just decided to walk regularly. But walking regularly, uh, that means uh, walking one hour or two hours, maximum three hours a day. I never walked the way I was walking there, as I told you, more than eight hours a day. So suddenly I started, I did eight hours. And the third day, How for... How did you feel? I didn't have any problem. But I have always walked in my life, uh, always walked and biked, but never in a, in a so intense way, you know, but it was okay. The only problem I had, I saw you that, uh, I told you I had some problems uh, with blisters in my feet and I lost uh, three nails. And it's only because the third day I walked uh, 56 kilometers, 35 miles, uh, uh, 35 miles. Why? Because I did not find any place. There was nothing and I had to go to uh, Chateau Thierry, which was really far off and I was planning to, to go that way. And it was raining all day. I was under the rain all day, all day, all day. So my feet were completely uh, wet and with my socks, of course. So I, when I, at night, it was uh, perfectly bloody. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I had a lot of things, but it was quite light. Uh, and it was uh, light, but too heavy. Uh, my backpack was uh, about uh, 15 pounds, plus a few pounds of the, the water, or the tea, and uh, a few things to, to, to eat, as I told you. Um, so between 15 and 20, uh, under 10 kilos. You know. So I had uh, everything for all kinds of weather, and I had also I had a big uh, jacket, uh, waterproof. Uh, and I had my um, small uh, notebooks. I had a small recorder, so I was talking as I was walking, and then at night I was writing this. Uh, I have my camera, uh, so a few things of me. And it was really better at the beginning, because at the beginning it was raining, it was cold, it was freezing. Some days it was under zero uh, centigrade, under 32 Fahrenheit. So I had everything on me. My, my backpack was very light. At the end, I, I was wearing just a shirt or a t-shirt, so everything was back. It was hot and it was more difficult. Uh, I knew already, and now I am sure, that I like winter more than summer. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did many people stop and offer you a ride when they saw you? Yes, yes, and I had to say no. <laughs> uh, many people, I would not say many, but uh, three or four times. Uh, spontaneously, people like, uh, they wanted to arrive, where are you going? And, uh, no, thank you, no, thank you. No. Very nice. nice. Yes? Was there news coverage of you? Did anyone yes, you? yes, uh, by uh, Arlington. Arlington County did uh, kind of uh, Arlington County, where I live, Cultural Affairs Division. We made kind of uh, a blog. Uh, it was called Where is DDA? <laughs> <laughs> is it still there? I don't think so. You can, you can check. Maybe, uh, maybe very still. And uh, so I was sending them every week some uh, blurb, and sending some photos. So they, they did something uh, regularly on my uh, on my walk. And then when I came back, uh, there was uh, some uh, article in the newspapers in Arlington. And on my way, there were articles in Reims, Aix La Chapelle, Aachen, and Weimar. Uh, local journalist. Uh, because f thanks to uh, the Goethe Institute in France, I had contacts in uh, Aachen, Weimar, and Berlin, and there they took contact uh, with uh, press people. So there I had some, I had an interview in uh, Weimar, for example, and, uh, and I was in the local newspaper. Yes? Did you ever cry with loneliness? Absolutely <laughs> not. I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I think uh, I think in uh, in our world, uh, London, uh, solitude is a luxury, uh, and I felt very, very well. It was uh, uh, it was no problem. It was I, I really enjoyed 
it was very peaceful, with the exception of sometimes being along uh, some uh, big roads, but it was very peaceful. The landscape was nice, uh, uh, fields, meadows, forests. I enjoyed very, very much, very much. Yes, I would say yes, generally speaking. Uh, the danger, the, the most dangerous thing was walking along the road. I remember a road in, it was in Belgium, there was no real uh, roadside. Mm -hmm. I had to walk on the road because there was a big, uh, dig there, a big uh, fossé. And I was walking there and there were so many big trucks. And each time, you know, you have to stop because the wind is... So that, the... the dangerous part and only I would say only once I was alone in the forest I met somebody who was alone also a guy I had, he had a very strange ways mm -hmm. you know and I think he was more afraid than me because I think he was a poacher and he thought he saw me coming from far away had a blue uniform you know mm -hmm. and he thought maybe that's uh, some uh, gendarme or somebody like that so it was very weird he tried to to hide himself and so on you know <laughs> he was doing i don't know what exactly but uh, <laughs> she enjoyed a lot and uh, she's a uh, very good uh, she, in very good uh, shape also very fit so she worked with me the, 20 miles immediately the first day, <laughs> like that. It was a very nice experience. It changed, it, changed, uh, it changed completely the mood. That's a very important thing because walking is not like biking, for example. And walking alone, alone is not like walking with somebody else. Uh, when you, I would say it's uh, very something when you are alone, it's more about uh, indeed meditation, you know. So it's not sadness, as you said, but maybe uh, the mood is more uh, reflective. It's a very different uh, way. When you are two people, you, you enjoy more, you talk, you, you sing together. That's a very different uh, approach, I think. It's very interesting. You wanted to ask a question? Yeah, what, what is your best souvenir of that experience? I would say the best souvenir is, uh, I would say, the strongest one. I think it's not the happiest, it's the saddest. But in, when I was in the near Verdun, and you saw these photos, of uh, the huge cemeteries, you have 100,000 people there. Uh, Berlin, uh, Verdun, it's uh, 700,000 people who, who died, I think, there. You have these huge cemeteries everywhere. And I was there, it was end of March. And it was completely foggy everywhere. So the atmosphere was very, very uh, uh, appropriate for that. Mm -hmm. It was the strongest moment in my way. And I, have, I am happy. I, it was the first time for me to go to Verdun, to visit Verdun and the, uh, the, the neighborhood, the, the Zalantour. And I, I was happy to be there with that weather. Because I, I didn't want, when I started my walk, I decided to start in winter the first day of spring, because I, I did not want to give, uh, to have the, the mood of vacation, summertime, and so on, because the topic was quite uh, hard or painful. So I wanted the, something, you know, with a different weather, and it was perfect for Verda. It was very, very, I was almost alone, you know. Uh, thousands of tombs, nobody in the fog, and you remember all these stupidities of the past. It was very, very impressive. On the other hand, there are some places where you tell yourself, I need to go back, I need to, uh, I want to see this place again. Oh yes, sure. And because, uh, for example, because uh, as I told you, I was walking very, very often on bike path. Many times I said, oh, that's very nice. That's very nice. Next time I will come, we will come back by bike and cross Germany, do another uh, way to visit, because many, many ways, uh, many places uh, I would like, of course, to, to go back, to be part of another project. Absolutely, yes. You live in Arlington. Yes. When you return, you see Arlington Cemetery differently. That's the only big, big, big cemetery I've been to. Yes, exactly. Yes, I would say yes. I would say yes. I go there. I live just nearby, near the cemetery, maybe uh, less than one mile from the cemetery. 
and I uh, go through the cemetery very often when I go when I walk to Washington uh, from where I live I go to the mall uh, National Gallery for example it's about one hour or 20 minutes so very often I go through the cemetery and that's true that I went through many many times but after the walk uh, uh, there was more there was a stronger connection maybe about the experience it was a little different absolutely You're more than welcome to come and see Didier if you have more questions and also have a look at the exhibition. Didier, yes. thank you mm -hmm. so much for thank sharing you. this experience with you, thank with you. us, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> If I can add something, the exhibition, uh, I, I wrote the exhibition. Yes. After my work, I was invited by a small publisher in Paris to do this exhibition about uh, the peace between France and Germany. The, this is one of the follow-ups of my uh, adventure. And the book? And the book also, uh, if you want to. Some of them were uh, I, I buy, I, and we're waiting for the English version. Yes. And maybe the German one that's... If you want a book, just ask me. But I hope you're all inspired now and you're going to walk back to Washington or um, <laughs> wherever you want. And uh, have a lovely day. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you.